Uh, last week, we began a study in the book of Ephesians that we introduced the church of Ephesus from the book of Acts. We went and looked at the Apostle Paul and his writing to the Ephesians, to the Ephesian church while he was in prison. Well, he wrote that at about the same time as he wrote the book of Colossians to the Colossian church. We looked at the office uh, and the authority of the apostles. Uh, we discussed that there were only 12 apostles uh, that God, uh, Christ had called, that they had a specific authority about them. There was a particular office. And once the apostles passed away, that office also passed away. There are no longer apostles, but the apostolic authority remains, and the authority remains in the Word of God. So, though we have no apostles with us, we have their writings with us, and they are just as authoritative as the rest of the Scriptures. And Peter points that out at the end of, I think it was his second epistle, when he compares Paul's writings to the writings of the Old Testament, just as authoritative. So, if anybody claims to be apostle today, they are a liar, as the Ephesian church found in the book of Revelation. We also discussed the idea of the saints. Who are the saints? What is sainthood? You know, the term saint is not designated only for those especially holy or worthy in the church or some office in the church, but it is for all believers. We also discussed the equality of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that all people must recognize Jesus Christ as Lord, equal in power and glory with the Father. And then finally, we examine the concept of God's grace and peace, which is granted to all believers in Christ. Regardless of the tragedies that we endure or the blessings that we enjoy, believers are under the care of God who brings all things together for good for those who love them. And we talked about that. Now today we're going to look at a very unique section of the book where Paul explains in some intricate details of the spiritual blessings we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verses 3 through 14, if you'll notice in your Bible, I don't know if, I don't think it is in the English, but in the Greek it's all one sentence where Paul is just overflowing with these blessings and he seems like he, he, he starts and he's unable to stop and what he does is he goes through these blessings from the Father and from the Son and from the Spirit. It's what we would call a run-on sentence almost which is one thing after another after another. So verses 3 through 14 and what we're going to do today is we're going to start very slowly because there is a whole lot to unpack in verse 3. So we'll just get to verse 3 and get that kind of unpacked and just touch on verse 4 maybe a little bit before we finish and then we're going to dive into the rest of that uh, as we proceed through our study. So the first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge the source of blessing. Uh, look at verse 3 if you would. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So where do you start? We look at all these blessings. We have 14 verses, or not 14, but we have verses uh, 3 through 14 talking about these blessings. But where do you start when you talk about the blessings? Well, you start at the source. The word blessed there means to be entitled to receive blessings or worthy of praise. So we start with the fact that God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is worthy of praise. When we consider God's goodness, it should drive us to praise. You know, we, I was listening uh, to, to Barry, he's talking about the, the wildlife and stuff like that. We see all this wonderful, and we see the same thing. We were, uh, Tammy was telling me that looking out and seeing all these different birds that we have in our yard and, and the other animals, you know, and I've, I've got the, the bees and the chickens, and, you know, and we look at all these things, what God has done. And it would, it's almost miraculous as you see how these things operate. And I was watching one bird in particular in the backyard, and he had this, I think it might have been some type of woodpecker or something. But we were, Tammy and I were both looking at it, and it had this really long bill, and it would like drive down in the ground and, and grab stuff, you know, probably an inch and a half down in the ground. You know, how God designed that, that bird. And, you know, we're thinking about these, all the good things that we have. 
What should that do as we consider these things? We should not be overly focused on the creation, but we, it ought to point us to the Creator, to the one who made all these things, the marvelous works that He has done, how great He must be to do the things that He has done. And as we look at these things and we look at God's goodness, it should drive us to praise. You know, it is common sense to expect thanks from those who are blessed. You know, many of us are grandparents, you know, and, or, or parents. You know, and uh, I remember uh, we, go, we, we go visit the kids, their grandkids, and we'll bring them gifts for their birthday or for Christmas or something like that. And many, many times I've heard from one of our kids, now don't forget to say thank you to Grandma and Grandpa. Well, that's just the way that, that we expect that from people. Well, so it is with God. Now, our judge of human character shows us how important this is. If somebody takes something of a, of a blessing or something wonderful has been done to them and they don't say thanks, they say, what, what's wrong with that person? You know, a person's life has been saved. You know, we expect the person to show gratitude for what has been done. Now, I remember one uh, years ago as, as a kid, uh, I think we were at the boardwalk in New Jersey or someplace. I, I don't know exactly. It was in the ocean. And we got caught in one of those riptide things, and it pulled us away, and it, we kept going deeper and deeper, and we didn't realize it, my sister and I, and we were towed under. And the lifeguards came out, and grabbed us, and pulled us back, back to, to shore. And you know, I remember saying, thank you. <laughs> you know, just, uh, I was gr gr great, uh, grateful for what had just happened. My life had been saved. Uh, and, and that's just natural. We, we, we expect that. But our failure to do so with God is much, much more serious than what it is when we fail to thank those uh, uh, fellow human beings who have blessed us. We are told that apostasy itself begins with a failure to give thanks. In Romans chapter 1, uh, we find that Romans one twenty one because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Praise ought to be the starting point whenever we consider the goodness of God. Not just being amazed at what He's done. We ought not let that take the focus away from Himself, His greatness, His goodness, His love, His mercy that we find in, in Him. The Scriptures command us to give thanks to God. Psalm 106 verse 1, and we find the same thing in 107.1 and 118, one. It says, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us, Oh, uh, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything give thanks. I remember in, in Bible college, one of my roommates, his, his dad was a pastor, you know, we're, we're handing out a couple of goodies, sharing some goodies. He said, oh, I wonder if we ought to ask the blessing. And one of the guys said, well, my dad says that anything co that costs a quarter or more, we ought to give thanks for. <laughs> you know? Well, actually, it's everything. Give thanks for everything uh, that God gives us. This, that is His will for us. Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The heart that has been blessed by God will respond in praise and worship. When Christ is revealed to you in His fullness, that is the natural response. It ought to be. Now we find Revelation chapter 4, where you have that scene in heaven around the throne of God, and where you have the saints giving thanks for all that has been done for them in Christ. That's the way it should be. You know, and we think about worship itself and praise itself. You know, whenever you get in, involved in some of these modern worship services, and you see the excitement and, and people having a great time, you know, and just, just uh, dancing. And, and you know, I, I wonder, I mean, I'm not to take away from what's in their hearts, but, but are we focused more upon the joy it's giving us than we are the praise we ought to be giving to God? So how can anyone who has seen and experienced the blessings in Christ not turn in gratitude to praise and worship the one who sent Christ? We ought to always thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God grants to us the blessings of the new covenant. 
Now, well, how do you get that out of this verse? Well, take a look. Back, back to chapter uh, 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how God is now identified. He is identified as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the Old Testament. How do we identify the God of the Old Testament? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now, there's, there's no way we can continue to identify Him by them. We have Jesus Christ. This is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to expound more upon this later, uh, uh, how the New Covenant includes all the nations outside of Israel, what God has done for them. But we have here this New Covenant description of God. This is who God is. We identify the Father through the Son, who did all things commissioned by the Father perfectly. You know, we think about sometimes a person might think of God as father, and if they've had a bad experience growing up, they've had a, a father who was abusive or drunkard, a drunkard or, or whatever, you know, they think, if God is, is a father, I don't know. But wait a minute, this is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we consider how wonderful he is, and that he is exactly like the father. We find John chapter 6 Verse 30, if I, have not, if I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. All of the things that Jesus did, He did according to the will of the Father. His every prayer was heard and answered and continues to be answered. And He describes Himself as one with the Father. To the point that He told His disciples, if you had known me, you would have known the Father also. And from now on you know Him and have seen Him. And he says, verse 9 of chapter 14 in John, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So what is the Father like? This, this God that we worship. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus and you see what He is like. And you see Him in all His perfection and all of His love and kindness and mercy. And this is how we now identify the true God by the revelation of Him in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this God who is the source of all of these blessings. And if we are to know Him, we must first know the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But what are the nature of these blessings? Let's take a look there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. First of all, we must understand that these blessings come at the initiative of God. It is He who has blessed us. Now we're going to find this being made plain and clear the further we move down in this section of the chapter. But one thing that we must put to death is the idea that I in some way bring these blessings upon myself. Now, the more I study the Scripture, the more I study the nature of man, the, the more I look at, into the work of the Trinity in salvation, I find that there is no reason for us at any point in salvation to say, it was me. It happened because of me. I heard the call. I understood the message. I chose to love Jesus Christ. I exercised my faith, which caused me, or caused him to bend his ear to me. The truth of God's word allows for none of that. Salvation is of the Lord. We find, we'll find later, we get to chapter 2, verse 8, it is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Your faith itself Say, well, there's an attitude, there's a, a doctrine going around. Well, everybody has faith. You just have to kind of stir it up and exercise it toward the right thing. And then you'll be saved. Well, what the scripture says is that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Faith is not something that's within you naturally. It comes from the outside of you as a blessing of God. And we'll see this as we go along. 
This is what we mean by amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's all of grace. As Spurgeon has said, it is all of grace. And these blessings we find are spiritual in nature. Now, this is another one of those things, if you kind of focus upon it and, and spend enough time on it, you say, wait a minute, this verse here is Trinitarian. You know, there is some controversy as to, to the nature of the Trinity in, in our apostate age that we live in. People are even questioning the Trinity. But here it is again, folks. Blessed be the God and Father. Okay, we have there God the Father. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. There you have God the Son, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. There is infer inference here of the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit who brings spiritual blessings. When you get to Galatians chapter 5, I think it is, it talks about the, or is it 6? I think it's 5. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit, where He brings these things to us. And it's He who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now take a look at that. He who has blessed us. Past tense. When we think about this, the blessings of God, He's already given us these blessings. Well, what do we mean? What, well, you know, we say, I, I, need, I need more love. You know, I, I need to be loving my, my neighbors better. I need to be loving people. But I need to love my, my wife more. I need to love my children. Wait a minute. He's already blessed us with love. The love of God has already been poured into our hearts by faith. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. You know, we pray for peace. I, I need peace of mind. You know, I'm, 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 having, I'm struggling with, with peace of mind. I, I need peace. Lord, give me peace. Well, Jesus has said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. John 14, verse 27. How about joy? You know, I, I'm, I'm walking around, I'm, I'm in a state of depression. I need the joy of the Lord. I just don't, can't seem to have it, but it's already been given to us, folks. We find John 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Or how about strength? I need strength to overcome the, the, the things that I face, uh, the struggles that I face. It's already there. I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's all readily available what has been given to us. We are to ask and we shall receive. It's not a matter of obtaining it. It's a matter of applying it. To learn how to do something with what we have. It's already a gift of God to us. You know, a person might be given a very nice car, a brand new fancy car. But if they don't know how to drive, they don't have a driver's license, it sits in the driveway. And that's pre we're pretty much where we are. We have all of these blessings readily available to us in Christ. Yet because we don't apply them, we, we, we don't take the, the effort to learn of them in the Word, then they remain idle and they don't help us. These blessings also are in the heavenly places in verse 3. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The Christian's blessings are in contrast to the blessings out of the Old Covenant. Now you think, okay, what about the blessings of the Old Covenant? Well, under the Old Covenant, the blessings were something that were tangible. You know, if the, if the children of Israel lived in obedience to the Lord, the Lord would bless them. He blessed them with the land. He blessed them in their flocks. He blessed them with health. He kept them safe from their enemies. All these things were tangible things that were promised to them if they obeyed the, the commands that He gave them. They were, the t they were tangible blessings. That's the blessings of the Old Covenant. Our blessings are, to the con are co contrasted with that. They're spiritual blessings. They're not blessings that are primarily focused upon this earth. They are blessings in the heavenly places. Now, not, to, not to say that the Lord doesn't bless us materially. We're, many of us are greatly blessed and we enjoy it. We thank the Lord for that. But that's not the main focus of the blessings of God. Uh, sometimes those blessings are given. We found in the book of Job that Job was greatly blessed, above, uh, greater than all the men of the East, and all those blessings came crashing down in one day. Everything. He lost everything in one day. But yet he still praised the Lord. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, he said. 
his focus, even, on, even in the patriarchal times, was not focused upon the material blessings, but on the spiritual inner blessings of the Lord. And these blessings are in the heavenly places. The blessings of the Christian under the new covenant are not primarily on this earth. Though we enjoy them, we ought to be thankful for them. We look for something greater. Ecclesiastes 5.18 Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good for all his labor which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him for it is his heritage. It's a good thing to do that. But we must be certain to keep these things in the proper priority. Colossians 3 verse 1 If then you were raised with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are told that Abraham sought for a city that had foundations, a heavenly city. Though he possessed many blessings on this earth, his focus was on the heavenly. We focus on the heavenly places where Jesus is. You know, if you look at verse 20, just down to verse 20 there in that chapter, which we'll get to later which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now think about that. Remember, Jesus is in a physical body. He ascended up in a body which could eat and drink, which was able to fellowship with the disciples, which the disciples could touch. Remember that. Now that very same body is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. So this is a genuine place. You, know, you think about the, the heavens. You know, Paul talked about three heavens. You had the third heaven was the heavenly places here. But you had the first and second heaven. The first heaven would be the atmospheric heaven of earth. We watch the birds fly in it. We get up in planes and we fly in that, that heaven. But then you have the stellar heavens. The heavens where the stars and the planets are. You've got that which is beyond our reach unless we get into a rocket ship and go out there that far. Uh, I don't ever want to do that. Uh, but uh, that you have the second heavens. Then you have this third heaven, which is the heavenly places. That is where the, the, our blessings are to be. The, we, we are to look for His blessings in this manner. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Everything that we have, folks, in this life, we are going to leave it behind. You know, you're, you're going to uh, that nice car, that nice house, uh, everything, the, the, the bank account or whatever you have, when you go, stays here. And your kids, your grandkids will fight over it. That's just, that's what's going to happen. Unless uh, we're hoping to do this and make plans with our, the little pittance that we have, we're going to make sure it's divided up so nobody can fight each other over it. You know, but we're going to leave it all behind. But our treasures are to be laid up in heaven where our Lord Jesus Christ is. Now, there's a glory which exceeds all that we can imagine. What, what is this place like? What are these blessings like? Well, we know that it's beyond our comprehension. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but, it, but as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Now we have these weird ideas about heaven and heavenly places. You know, that you, know, you go up and you have the harp, and you're strumming the harp, and you're on your cloud. <laughs> now, I, it makes me laugh when you think about it. Heaven is actually something that is so immense and amazing, we can't describe it. When Paul actually did, we believe it was Paul, saw this third heaven, he says, I'm not allowed to talk about what I saw. God says, he, he shut his mouth. No, no, I don't want them to know this. They're going to find out when they get there. It's almost like you have the, the surprise, you know, you have someone with their eyes covered, you say, okay, you lead them in there, and then you open up, and oh, there, you know, happy birthday, and you have, you know, whatever. It's almost like that for us. We don't, we can't, I think one reason, because it's beyond our comprehension, the blessings which await those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have these blessings in a spiritual place. 
Then we have finally the agent of the blessings in verse 3, where it says, the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places are in Christ. So how are all these blessings brought to the believer? How are they realized? Only in Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be blessed. Acts 4.12 tells us that there, nor is there, is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We must proclaim this from the housetops. And what this is a, a doctrine we can say is the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. In other words, there are no other ways to God. There are no other ways to be blessed. It is impossible. Uh, we need to get that out of our mind. We need to correct people. people. People might say, well, you know, there's many paths to God. No, there is not. There is one way to God. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. One way, Jesus Christ. That's why, you wonder, why is it that Christianity is hated so much? Why, why is it, you know, people love other religions. Well, other religions are willing to, to, yeah, to give and take a little here. We can't do that, folks. You know, it's like with the Roman Empire. Uh, whenever they, they set up the idols for Caesar, and you need to give your little pinch of salt. I forget it, and you get to get your license, the licit or something. I forget exactly what it was called. But you gave your pinch of salt to Caesar, and they gave you a certificate that you gave your pinch of salt in worshiping Caesar as God, and you were then okay. And then you can go on and do whatever religion you wanted, as long as you did that. Christians could not even do that, because they had to say, Caesar is Lord. Well, no. Jesus is Lord. Caesar is under Jesus. What? You mean the crucified one? See, that, that was an insult to them. And Christians were willing to die rather than, than to accept that, that they could give an offering to a false god and also wor worship Jesus. You can't do that. It, it's, uh, Jesus is exclusive. And I, I say that because I've heard from very prominent preachers that would say that, oh, there's other ways to, to, to God. A person that's living in an isolated place somewhere in the world, if they look up and, and they decide that they want to worship God, God will accept that and they'll go to heaven. You now you have the God of, you have people within Islam, you have people in Hinduism and Buddhism. They're good people, but they just don't quite have the, the name of Jesus or the concept of Christ. They're still good. No, no folks. We need to tell them. We need to send missionaries to them. We need to do whatever we need to do to get the word to them. You must have Jesus Christ. You must submit yourself to Him as Lord. You need to, to believe in Him for who He is if you're to be saved. You need to turn from your sin and turn to, to God through Him if you are to be saved. And that's the only way. There are no other ways to heaven. There is no other way to heaven. Now that's becoming a more and more popular idea. As I mentioned, John 14, 6 is just as true as it is today as it was during John's time when Jesus said it. But in a world of inclusion that we live in, it is overlooked at best and outright denied at worst. But we need to constantly focus on that. Our Lord will accept no others in His place. He is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. We must accept that fact and we must tell, tell the, the folks that hear us as we t tell them the Gospel, you must receive Him as Lord. You know, we must also use caution not to present false promises to any person who rejects Jesus Christ. You know, a person who says, I don't want this Jesus Christ. I, uh, I can't stand Him. I hate Him. And we, we ought not to say, well, you know, the Lord loves you. And what, uh, the love of God, I mean, yes, God does love all folks in, in, uh, in a sense, but we're warned about those who reject our Lord Jesus Christ. There are no blessings for them. The depth, we, we revel in the depth of God's love. You know, we think the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The wandering child is reconciled by God's beloved Son. The aching soul again made whole and priceless pardon won. The wonderful love of God, but that love of God is connected always to Jesus Christ. A person who rejects Jesus Christ rejects the love of God uh, completely. And so what, what, are we, what, what about them? 
They're described also in chapter 2, and we'll get to that. In verse 2, where it describes us as we, the way we used to be. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince uh, of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So we talk about this love of God, but we need to warn people about the wrath of God. That if you reject Jesus Christ, you refuse to repent of your sins and turn to Christ, you are a child of wrath. Don't expect the benefits of God's love. If you reject the love of God as shown in the cross in Jesus Christ, now we, we, we have to, the, the world is so syrupy and sweet, and, and I mean, it gives this message out about uh, God loves everybody. You know, well, you know, God, if, if you're hearing the gospel, that's a, that's a, a uh, sign of the love of God toward mankind. But if you reject Jesus Christ, you are under his wrath and you are a child of wrath. So we need to warn people about that. Now, I was reading this morning in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28 and verse, I think it was, I can't read my own writing here, but it's, it's in chapter 28, you know, where the warnings are given to, to the Israelites. It says that so the, the, if they reject the Lord and begin following after other gods and do not follow his commandments, this is what was said to them. So the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing. It says the Lord will rejoice over that and His justice. So there's a, there's, a, there's a thing called the justice of God as well as the love of God. So can we offer Christ's rejectors any of the promises dedicated to God's people? And we look at these promises here in, in chapter 3, or chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 3. Can we offer them any of these promises? Not outside of Christ. We cannot. They're only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. The special favor and care of God for fallen humanity is found in Jesus Christ alone. Those remaining outside of Christ face only God's horrendous wrath. And this is where you, know, you, you get to be called a hellfire damnation preacher, I guess. Yeah, because now I'm preaching about the wrath of God. What? What? There is such a thing as the wrath of God. You wouldn't know that listening to most preachers today. But there is something called the wrath of God. Those who reject Christ will fall under the wrath of God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31. That is why 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So how do we implore people through Jesus Christ? Come to God, be reconciled to God. How am I as a sinner to be reconciled to God? In Jesus Christ. He will bear the wrath of those who come to Him. And they are then a son, become a son of God. So then... What are these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places? It begins in the heavenly places in eternity past before you were born. Before any of us were born. Before the world existed. Take a look at verse 4. And we're just going to touch it and then just give you a taste of it. And we're going to open it up then the next time. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So here we have it. And when you get down to this section, you have the blessings of the Father. That's uh, verses 4 through 6. Then you have the blessings of the Son, verses 7 through uh, 13, or, 14, or 12. And then you have the blessings of the Spirit, verses 13 through 4. And this is what we call the economical trinity. That is, you have the working of the Trinity together in the salvation of man. These are the blessings, and they begin outside of us before we were ever existed, as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. And I've heard people, and we'll get into this next time, Lord willing, 
They'll do anything they can to make this not say what it says. Well, it's not talking about him choosing us, that us, of course, there being the saints, but it's, a, it's, it's choosing Jesus, or it's choosing the way you know, of salvation. But folks, what does the scripture say? What does it say? He chose us. He loved us. In eternity past, his mind was on us, the saints. You are loved by God. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you love Jesus Christ, He is your Lord and you worship Him and, and you desire to be with Him and you're looking forward to His coming, you were in the mind of God in eternity past and He loved you and chose you in eternity. Now we don't understand all the details. We'll get into that as we go on. But next time we will begin looking into this mystery. Uh, perhaps the most misunderstood and hated doctrine of Scripture. We have covered it not too long ago as well. But to the believer, it ought to be a source of comfort and assurance. And by the way, this is not for something for those outside of Christ to ponder. You know, a person who is not in the faith or so, oh, I, wonder if, I wonder if I am one of the elect and I, I don't know if I can come. No, that's not for you. No, it's, it's for the believers to contemplate these things because what's for you is to come to Jesus Christ. And then you'll find all of these things. You'll understand these things much better. It's not, it's not for us to, to, to try to, to give these truths to the, to the unbeliever. These are deep and heavy truths for you, the believer. We are to present to them Jesus. Uh, there is no possibility that the natural mind can comprehend any of these things without first being reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're an unbeliever, your duty is to first learn of the Lord Jesus Christ and come to Him and submit yourself to Him. And let us pray.